Imagine if you had your entire life savings and everything that you owned taken away from you. Imagine if it was taken away from you by someone who lied to you and deceived you and tricked you out of it. Then imagine that in order to balance the scales of justice for you having been victimized in this way, you were now punished for having been deceived. That seems like that would be a further injustice, to punish the victim for having been deceived. Yet religion loves to promote the idea that you might be deceived, and that as a result of having been deceived, God is going to execute a punishment against you. That seems to me to be an injustice. And if that is the case, then either that image of God is false. That representation of how God is is not true. Or God is unjust. But we see in Genesis chapter 3 that it says, The Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And so religion presents a false view of what's going on here in this chapter. And it says that what they did was to reject God and to rebel against God and to decide they don't need God. But it makes much more sense to view it as though small children falling from innocence, wondering if God is good to me, then why is this the case? And a deceitful voice saying to them, you know, you're on your own. God's not on your side. You have to do it for yourself. And so God came to them and said, Where are you? What's going on? Tell me about what's happening. So that he could comfort them. He was not hunting them down in order to administer his retribution for their not doing what they're told. For their rebellion against his tyrannical reign. But he sought them out in order to comfort them and to cover them and to say, it's okay. And he used the technique of questioning because the alternative would be to make accusation. And religion presents it as though these questions were accusations where are you? But it's more like, where are you? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to? Who told you that you were naked? Oh, did you eat from the tree that I told you not to? They're entirely different things. The way that you would comfort a child by questioning what had happened. When that child is afraid, because a deceitful voice said that God's not on your side and you're on your own, good luck. And so, to internalize that and to accept that, is to eat that fruit. And to eat that fruit is to become afraid of God, and to hide, and to feel ashamed, and to feel naked and afraid of God. And so, then imagine that there's a war and the liberating force defeats the enemy and goes into the enemy camp and finds a building full of people who are bound and blindfolded and since those people are in the enemy camp they take them and they imprison them and they torture them does it seem like maybe perhaps the correct response to that situation would have sounded something more like this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Does it seem more like that the liberating force, actually being on the side of good, having defeated the enemy, should have pulled off the blindfolds and unbound them and set them free and said, do you need medical attention? 
Do you need to get cleaned up? You're free. You are now liberated. The enemy has been defeated. That would seem to be what a liberating force should do to the prisoners of the enemy. But religion promotes the idea that the enemy is imprisoning and blinding people, and yet, although the enemy is imprisoning and blinding people, God is going to punish them and measure out retribution against those who have been victimized, those who have been imprisoned, those who have been taken captive. And instead of liberating them, God is going to punish them. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that it talks about people being blinded. And so the law of Moses is being attacked here. It's being called a ministry of death, written and engraved in stones, which would make them graven images. For the ministration of condemnation, it is referred to. It is said that it is that which is done away. But it says that Moses put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is now abolished, which means that the law is now abolished. It says in verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Well, that sounds kind of like the liberating force would come and set the captives free and pull off those blindfolds and say the enemy has been defeated. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But where the law is, there is a veil blinding people. Again, in verse 14, their minds were blinded because of Moses, because of the law, because of valuing people based on their performance, their compliance to the set of rules that their denomination holds them to. How well do you comply? Well, that's how well we value you. If you comply well enough, we'll accept you. If you perform poorly enough, then you won't even belong to our congregation. It says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And then we get to verse chapter 4. And in chapter 4, we read, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Now is it me, or did we just read something about minds being blinded and how they were blinded? Hmm. Second Corinthians 3.14 But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, meaning Moses, meaning the law. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. So what is doing the blinding? is a rival to God running around throwing blindfolds over people's faces so that they can't believe? Or is an adherence to the law, a belief in a performance-based valuation system, a belief that you are what you do and your value is how well you do it? Is that what is blinding people? And even if it is some supernatural spirit being running around throwing blindfolds on people, would it be just to liberate them and to open their eyes or to punish them for having been taken captive? In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded that the light shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
And I've heard so many messages about how this rival to God looks just like God, sounds just like God, acts just like God, does the same things as God does. That this rival to God is a counterfeit. And that if you know anything about counterfeits, you need to be well educated to discern the difference between the counterfeit and the genuine article. Some people need years of training when it comes to certain kinds of things to discern the counterfeit from the real thing. And what this does is put people into fear, always needing to wonder, is it God or is it the devil? Could I maybe be being deceived? Could it be that I've been led astray by a false doctrine? Because who knows, maybe this is a trick of the devil. He's a counterfeit to God who looks almost perfectly, precisely, and exactly like God. And wouldn't a just God, if that were true, say, well, they think they're worshiping me. They think they're paying honor to me. I would read the thoughts and intents of their heart, even if their actions weren't perfectly, precisely, exactly pointed in the right direction. I would think that a just God would be okay with that if you called him by the wrong name or performed the wrong ritual if the intent was right. But religion wants to tell you that if you utter the name incorrectly or you perform the wrong ritual or you have the wrong doctrine, then God is so narrow-minded that he'll reject you and find you unacceptable because you didn't get all your doctrine ducks in a row. And so we get to this part in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the one passage that single-handedly has deceived people into believing that God and the devil are almost indistinguishable from one another, that their attributes and characteristics are almost perfectly, precisely in alignment with one another, and they're virtually indistinguishable from one another. But we'll back up and find out what's happening here, because we see again a reference to Eve and the serpent. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I fear lest any me by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And so here we get this idea. Oh, you've got another Jesus. You've got another spirit. You've got another gospel. Uh-oh, you're going to be deceived by a Jesus who looks just like Jesus, but isn't the real genuine article Jesus. And a gospel that looks just like the real gospel, but isn't the genuine article gospel. And it's almost indistinguishable, but aha, I found that one single solitary point of doctrine which reveals it, because I have the expertise to know the difference. Or could it be that if it's not simple, it's not the gospel. And if it's not liberty, it's not the gospel. And if it's not restoration and removing of blindness and healing up of brokenheartedness, then it's not the gospel. That another Jesus would be one that holds you to a performance-based standard and says, you are what you do, and your value is based on how well you do it. Well, let's see. We get to verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. Now there's no reason to think that he suddenly started talking about supernatural spirit beings having a magical glow that makes them look like beautiful angels in the sky. That's not what's being said here. He's talking about people who are false apostles, deceitful workers, and pretending to be apostles of Christ. 
because they are sneaking into the meeting houses and spying out their liberty and saying, let's see if you've been circumcised and you need to follow the law of Moses. And what does it say? That the adversary himself is transformed into, an, into a messenger of righteousness and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But it's a religious righteousness, a false righteousness, a hypocrisy righteousness that elevates religious ritual and tradition above those acts of kindness and acts of compassion and acts of mercy and acts of healing and restoration. So what is being said here is not about a being that you will look at and see a magical glow and think, oh no, I can't tell. Is it the devil or is it an angel of God? It's beautiful. It's glowing magically. It's floating in the sky. It's making a beautiful sound. Can't tell the difference. So I suggest that the difference between God and the devil is as stark as that of night and day. That there is a strong an undeniable contrast, and that the devil is not by any means a counterfeit to God. That the devil is not something that looks just like God, acts just like God, sounds just like God, but you better find that little point of doctrine that's trying to lead you astray. Because woe is you if you fall victim of deceit, or if you fall captive to an oppressor. So first, let's take a look at the idea that Devils are associated with child sacrifice. And we'll see that in a number of passages here real quick in the Old Testament. Leviticus 17.7 And they shall no more offer their sacrifices to devils after whom they have gone a-whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. 18.21 You shall not let any of your seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shall you profane the name of God. I am the Lord. Deuteronomy 18.10 There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter to pass through the fire. Deuteronomy 32.17 They sacrificed them to devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up whom your fathers feared not. Psalms 106.37 Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Sacrificing children to devils. So devils are associated with bloody child sacrifice. By contrast, we'll see in Jeremiah chapter 7 that God didn't even demand sacrifice neither child sacrifice. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. So God didn't even command sacrifice at all. Certainly not child sacrifice. We see in Jeremiah chapter 32, starting in verse 34, But they set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to defile it, and they built the high places of Baal which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So it never even occurred to God that child sacrifice was something acceptable. He calls it an abomination and continues to tell us what God is like. And now therefore thus saith the Lord the God of Israel concerning this city whereof you say it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Behold I will gather them out of all countries whither I have driven in mine anger and my fury and great wrath and I will bring them again unto this place and I will cause them to dwell safely and they shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and for the children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. And so what God has looks entirely different than the sacrifice of children. Devils, bloodshed and sacrifice of children, and God, a new covenant of one heart from which he will never depart. 
So now we get to Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 17 and 18, and see some more insight here. It says, For thus says the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle a meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. So here we see that there's not going to be somebody replacing Caesar on the throne as the Messiah, but that no one will sit on the throne, and that sacrifices were never meant to be and will not be done continually. So there will be no sacrifice, and there will be no one sitting on the throne. But we have this idea that religion promotes that peace is from the devil, and false prophets preach peace. So where does this come from? Well, well, let's look at a bunch of things in Jeremiah that have to do with the fact that the Babylonians are going to come and they are going to take over and they are going to destroy the temple. And really the message is, don't fight the empire. Put your neck under, their, under the yoke of the king of Babylon and then you will be able to dwell safely in the land. So... The false prophets were saying, no, you have a magical shield of protection. You're God's chosen people. We're invincible and we cannot lose. Stand up and fight against the empire. This is repeated again with the Roman Empire, where they are advised not to fight the Roman Empire, but they say, no, we are God's chosen people. We are the elect. We have a magical shield of protection over us. We will fight the Roman Empire and prevail. And they did not. And the temple was destroyed, and many people died because they did not put their neck under the yoke of the Roman Empire. So the real message here is to put your neck under the yoke of the Babylonian king. And the peace that they were professing was not one where unity is from the devil, but one that actually said, stand up and fight the Babylonian Empire because you are magically protected. So if... It's a message saying, you are safe from harm no matter what you do because you are God's chosen elect. That might be a false message. But if it's a message saying, live in peace with one another. If it's a message saying, seek to be peaceful and live peaceably with one another. That is not from the devil. So let's look at this. In Jeremiah chapter 8. It says, For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, saying slightly, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. So this is what they're talking about. We'll continue further and look at more. Jeremiah, or in First Thessalonians, there's the Roman counterpart. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. That's a Roman counterpart to the same thing that's going on here with the king of Babylon. So we go to Jeremiah 27, 6, 18. Six, verses 6 to 18. And we see this contrast between the different prophets and what they have to say about the king of Babylon. It says, And now I have given these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. All nations shall serve him, and his son, and his son's son, until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. And it shall come to pass that the nation of the kingdom which shall not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, says the Lord, with the sword, with the famine, with the pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. Therefore hearken not to your prophets, nor to your diviners, your dreamers, nor your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you, to remove you far from your land, that I should drive you out, and you should perish. But the nation that brings their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, and serve him, those will I let remain still in their own land, says the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell therein. So here the message that Jeremiah has is to put your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon. The false prophets were saying, no, stand up and resist, stand up and fight the king of Babylon. And so there's the difference there that is being shown is that on one hand, you have 
being subordinate to the king of Babylon. And on the other hand, you have putting your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon. And in Jeremiah chapter 28, there's a long passage between Hananiah and Jeremiah. And Hananiah says, no, Jeremiah, you're a false prophet. We need to resist the, the king of Babylon. And Jeremiah says, no, Hananiah, if you're right, then we'll see because there will be peace. But and it will come to pass, but I'm telling you, put your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon. And so this is mirrored again. The Babylonian captivity and destruction of the first temple is mirrored again near 70 AD, where they fought against the Roman Empire, thinking that they had a magical shield of protection and that God was with them. And instead, the Romans destroyed the temple and brought it to ruins and ended the system that they had. So the contrast is that God said to use wisdom. God said, no, no, do the reasonable thing. The stronger empire is the stronger empire. And if you behave in this kind of way, then it will be good for you. So it wasn't that being at, in fact, if you really think about it, he said, be at peace with the Babylonian Empire and you'll be allowed to stay in your land and things will be good for you. But if you stand up and fight and resist, so what you have to do is to understand the context that's being used there is that it's not saying that peace is something that the devil professes that false prophets are prophets of peace, but rather that false prophets are prophets of resisting and that God said, put your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon. So the peace is only false prophecy when it's a magical protection from harm. And we see by contrast in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 11 it says finally brethren farewell be perfect be of good comfort be of one mind live in peace and the god of love and peace shall be with you well if peace is from the devil then he's saying to follow the follow the devil here i guess because the thing is that peace is of god and god is the god of love and the god of peace Now in Zechariah chapter 3, we see how Satan makes accusation and says, you're not good enough. You, don't, you are not worthy of your position. And it says, and he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan, even the Lord. He has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And that's the accusation being made. He is not worthy to be given this position. And he answered and spake to those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head, and clothed him with the garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house, and shall keep my course. And I will give you places to walk among those that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you. The, and your fellows that sit before you, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, unto one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, said the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, said the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. So there it starts out. Satan says he's not worthy and when it gets to the end, the God says, every man's your neighbor. That sounds like peace to me. So I would say that, again, we're seeing this stark contrast, not something that looks like, uh, you know, which one is which? 
Is it is it the counterfeit or is it the genuine article? I can't tell. I wish I had some tool of discernment to be able to tell the difference between accusation and peace with one another. I really just, it's, it's almost indistinguishable from one another. If only there was a tool of discernment. If only I had a doctrine that would tell me. If only I had years and years of study that would make it clear to me. So what does the devil say? The devil says, if you be the son of God, then prove it. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And tempted means, uh, has to do with being tested in order to make an accusation. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and was afterwards unhungered, then came the tempter to him and said, if you be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. In verse six, it says, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down for it is written. So here it is. The devil says, if you are the son of God, then prove it. But what does God say? I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized with John in Jordan. And straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If you are the son of God, then prove it. You are the son of God in whom I am well pleased. Yep, hardly notice the difference. I have to be an expert with a very highly trained eye to tell the difference between. Prove that you're a son. And you are my beloved son. Hmm. If only I was better trained. If only there was some tool of discernment that I could tell the difference between the devil and God. They are so utterly similar. We see now that devils, having previously been associated with child sacrifice, which God never commanded, never entered into his mind even, now devils are going to be associated with infirmity, with illness, and Jesus is going to perform healing. So Jesus being the representation of the nature and character of God is going to perform healing, and devils are going to perform afflicting. And certain women came which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmity. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. And so there we see, healed of evil spirits. So evil spirits is something that you are healed from. Just in case you might need a little clarification about what that even is about when it talks about being possessed of devils. It's talking about an illness. It's talking about a need to be healed. So we get to Matthew chapter 17. And where am I in my notes? Ah, uh, yes. Chapter 17 and verse 14. And there came to the multi uh and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falls into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. So he was cured of having been possessed of a devil. And so, again, we associate Jesus with healing, God with healing, and the devil with afflicting people with the disease. <clears throat> Mark chapter 1, verse 34, And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to, to speak because they knew him. So again, we're seeing an association between devils and, and having some disease from which to be healed. So then we go to Mark chapter 3, and we see that Jesus gets accused of healing by the power of the devil, because they didn't think that he seemed like the kind of person that God would work through in order to heal people. And in verse 14 it says, And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. <clears throat> So then in verse 22, it says, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem says, He has Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils he casts out devils. And he called them unto him, and he said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? 
If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. For if a house be divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. So first of all, it's not God doing the not forgiving. It's about a mindset. Because what are they doing? They are taking the power of God, which is healing, and assigning it to the devil. They are saying that the devil can look and act like God and have the power of God, and they are accusing him of healing by the power of the devil. And if that is your mindset, then so long as you are in that mindset, you're going to be in a state of thinking that you need to be careful, you need to be suspicious, you need to wonder, is this maybe a trick of the devil to lead me astray from my doctrine? Because this man is not the sort of man who should be performing healing by the power of God. Because God would have nothing to do with a sinner such as this. And so Jesus says, why would Satan act counterproductive to himself? So if being possessed by devils is to have an illness, then why would the why would the one providing the illness provide the relief of that illness if the agenda of Satan is to afflict people with illness? Why would he cure it? That makes no sense. And so that's what Jesus was saying. He was saying, this, your, your logic doesn't even make sense. God does healing, the devil does afflicting. That's how it works. Healing, afflicting, they're not similar to each other. Mark chapter 9, verse 38, it says, John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and he follows not us. And we forbade him, because he doesn't follow us. And Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do any miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me, for he that is not against us is on our part. So here he says, even if they're not following us, even if they're not one of us, if they're doing healing in our name, then good. They're on our side. So it doesn't matter if you think that that person conforms to your denomination's identity. If they're doing a work of healing, then that's all that matters. It says, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. So it's about what you're doing in healing people, and not what doctrine you ascribe to. It says that you don't actually even need to be part of that organization. All you need to do is be acting in an ali in alignment with their goals. So if your mission is the same mission, if what you're performing is the same thing being performed, if your goal and your outcome is the same, then you're on the same side. So now we're going to take a deeper look at how they were thinking that Jesus was not the sort of person that should be performing these healings and why they would make this accusation that he's healing by the power of the devil and why they would think that he's not the sort of person that God would work through. So we start in John chapter 9 and Jesus heals a man who is blind. And it says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his di disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered and said, Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but the works of God should be made manifest in. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said, Go, wash in the, pool, in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore he washed, and he came seeing. And so now, first of all, the Pharisees don't even believe that this guy was blind to begin with. They think this has got to be a trick, because there's no way Jesus is healing blind people, because God would have nothing to do with working works of healing through someone like Jesus, who is a glutton and a sinner and sits with sinners and he's born of fornication and he violates the Sabbath. <clears throat> and so it says in verse 13, they brought to, uh, to the Pharisees him that was aforetime was blind. 
And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keeps not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. So they were divided over whether God can perform healing through a sinner or not. And many of them thought, Well, no. That's not possible. God doesn't work that way. They say to the blind man again, What do you say of him that has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. So they didn't even believe that he was actually blind and then was made to be able to see. So they called his parents, and his parents said, uh, Well, we'll affirm that he's our son and he was born blind, but we're not going any further than that because they were afraid that they would be put out of the synagogue. So he, the parents said, He is of age, ask him. And so again they called the man that was blind and said to him, Give God the praise, we know that this man is a sinner. So he said, they're, they're saying, There's no way that he could heal you because he's a sinner. And he answered and he said, Whether he be a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. And so they said uh, to him again, What did he do? How did he open your eyes? He said, I have told you already and you did not hear. Why do you want to hear it again? I will, uh, uh, will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. They say, We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't know where he came from. The man answered and said to them, Where herein is a marvelous thing, that you know not from where he is, but he has opened my eyes. And they say, We know that God doesn't hear sinners. But if this man, any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, that's who he hears. So they said, Jesus is absolutely not the kind of person that God would be uh, working through. And they said, since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And so he's schooling them. And they say, you were altogether born in sins and you teach us. And they cast him out. So that goes right back to the disciples asking, you know, why was this man born blind? Who sinned, him or his parents? And so they said he was born in sin because he was born blind. Then in John chapter 10 and verse 20, it says, And many of them said, He has a devil and mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that has a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of a blind? So they're having a dispute over whether healing can be done by a sinner like Jesus. And so the devil is a means of affliction. The devil is afflicting people, and Jesus is healing people. So again, this is not something that looks similar to one another. This is not something that you need to have a well-trained eye in order to discern the difference between one and the other. If we go to Acts chapter 10, verses 36 to 40, it says, The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all of Judea, began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went out doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. So here we have Jesus who's doing good and healing. And what is he healing? Those that were oppressed of the devil. And God was with him. So here we have the devil being associated with oppression and Jesus being associated with healing and doing good. I'm really not feeling like it takes a well-trained eye to see the difference between the two. Here's a verse that gets really horribly misrepresented. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So what are doctrines of devils? Well, it's about to tell us. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be received, refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is thanks, sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And so 
the doctrines of devils offer prohibitions. Where there is the spirit of Christ, there is liberty. You are set free from such things. But here, the doctrines of devils are prohibitions. Why? Because hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? To elevate religious works and traditions of religion work of religious works above those acts of kindness and helping the needy. So that's about the the doctrines of devils are going to give you prohibitions against things that there's no reason for you to be prohibited from doing. So now we see a contrast here between the wisdom that is devilish and the wisdom of God. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So let's look. That's gonna. We've got envying and strife and confusion and every evil work. That's probably going to look almost perfectly, exactly, precisely like what we get from God. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle. Wait, am I reading this wrong? Because this doesn't sound similar to bitter envying and strife, confusion, and every evil work. This sounds completely different. Something must be wrong here. Okay, wait. If you have bitter envying and strife, where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. Hmm. It, it, it would seem here that there's something completely different from envying, strife, and confusion. And, and what we have, by contrast, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Wow. that That's almost like they're completely different from one another. Hmm. Maybe I just need a well-trained... Maybe I need years of expertise and a well-trained eye to see how they're not completely, totally, utterly different from one another. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it only seems like they're opposite from each other, but once you get that well-trained eye, boy, they're they're virtually indistinguishable. Wait, wouldn't that be kind of like being blind? Hmm, interesting. Romans 16.20, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I wish I could tell which one is which. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Hmm. They're virtually indistinguishable from each other, aren't they? 